30 years ago this weekend, the Washington Redskins were playing the New York Giants in East Rutherford, New Jersey. Joe Gibbs, Bill Parcells. It was the 1987 strike shortened season, and for three weeks, Lionel Vital tormented opposing defenses. 30 years ago on Sunday, Lionel ran for 128 yards and a touchdown in a 38 to 12 win over the Giants. In three NFL games, he racked up 346 yards on the ground and two touchdowns. Today, we celebrate Lionel's induction into the Nichols Hall of Fame and recognize a lifetime of success. Lionel grew up outside of Lafayette with four sisters, two brothers, and a single mom and loving grandparents. He was the first to attend college, but the rest of his family followed in his footsteps. Two of his sisters went on to achieve degrees from Nichols, and today, three are teachers. Lionel was an incredible baseball player, as you heard from Brian Strapolo, but Sonny Jackson, he convinced him that the football field is where he belonged. Sonny played a profound part in his life. He became a father figure. Vital, when you walk into a room, look a man in his eye and shake his hand with a firm grip. Lionel spent his Colonel career sharing touches with the number two all-time running back in Nichols history, which is why Oscar Smith and Lionel Vital are the best one-two punch in program history. He ran for 1,500 yards and nine touchdowns. He was part of the foundation that led Nichols to a 34 and 22 record over a five-year period. The Redskins selected him in the seventh round of the 1985 draft, and he bounced around the league before finishing his career in the CFL. It was 1990 and time for a new change. His playing days were over, but he loved the game and had a natural eye for talent. 27 years ago, Bill Belichick was a 38-year-old first-year head coach with the Cleveland Browns. Before the five Super Bowl titles and the Hall of Fame resume, he was a guy in Cleveland trying to win. As a scout, Lionel Vitale's first boss was Bill Belichick. A career was created and a future as an NFL executive was born. In the last 27 years, Lionel has been a scout with the Browns, the Jets, the Patriots, the Falcons. He's now the director of college scouting for the Dallas Cowboys. When Lionel was growing up in South Louisiana, the matriarch of the household was Hazel Vital. She always told her children, treat people right. Don't worry about what you can get from treating them right. Just do it. Those words would play a profound part in Lionel's life. Last January, the Falcons made a number of changes in their front office. After nine years in Atlanta, Lionel was out of a job. On the night he found out, Lionel and his wife decided to get out of the house and go out to dinner. After a few hours, they came home and saw that little red light blinking on their answering machine. Lionel, this is Will McClay with the Dallas Cowboys. Give us a call when you have the chance. If you Google Lionel's name, one of the first stories you'll read is from March 2016 on ESPN.com. Lionel Vital joins the Cowboys off of strong recommendations, the headline reads. The article quotes Jerry Jones and his son Stephen about why they hired Lionel, how instrumental Bill Belichick and Ozzie Newsom's recommendations were. Stephen Jones said, quote, obviously Jerry and I liked him, but it was important for Will to get him. What the article fails to mention is why Will McClay ran into Jerry Jones' office and said, Lionel Vital is available, we have to get him. You have to go back to the early 90s when McClay was working with the Detroit Dive of the Arena Football League. He was calling NFL scouts to talk about players, but no one was returning his phone call, except Lionel Vital of the Cleveland Browns. On the night Lionel found out the Falcons were going in a new direction. He came home and returned Will's phone call. The Cowboys 
senior director of player personnel told him that when he was in the AFL, nobody would talk to him. Couldn't get a return phone call. Messages went unanswered. Then I spoke with you, and you gave me 30 minutes. I never forgot that. In the words of Hazel Vital, be good to someone. People will remember that. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinguished honor to welcome Lionel Vital into the Nichols State University Hall of Fame. He stole my son. I was going to tell those stories. <laughs> that's okay. Um, wow, that's a lot. I'm humbled. You know, I'm a humble guy from a really humble, modest beginning. And um, I have the crying disease in here today. <laughs> um, just goes to show you, no matter where you're from, and You can do it, you know, and you can take it to the highest level. When, when people doubt you, you know, just okay, cool. Just channel it and um, say, I can get it. I'm going to show them, you know, and, you know, use that energy to, to go get it. Um, I, I want to start off by uh, thanking all the people that voted uh, for me, uh, elected me to come here. When I got the call, like, I was like, Keith, come on, man, you kidding me? No, you pick somebody else, not me, you know? I'm like, why me? He said, come on, Lionel, you, you, you deserve this. So I said, all right, okay, all right, cool. But uh, very humbled by this, very glad to be here, very honored. Uh, it all started at Nickel State. Uh, really, I'm, I'm ahead of myself. It didn't start at Nickel State. Nickel State just took it to the next level. It started in Laurelville. Uh, coming out of Laurelville, my senior year in high school, I was a good baseball player. I thought I'd be a baseball guy because nobody wanted me in football. Nobody. Coach Crochet, the guy right there, you want to raise your hand? He called everybody who would listen. Northwestern, UL Lafayette, Tulane took, I went up there for a visit. Um, we just, we called people left and right. Everybody said, nah, not good enough, too small, small school, blah, blah, blah. Coach said, you can do it, Lionel. Joe Washington, all those little running backs from Oklahoma, your size, they go to big schools, you know about them, but you can do it. Trust me, I know you can do it. So we called Nichols, and um, they, were, they just fired the staff, and I forget the name of the coach who came in to recruit me. Uh, he said, we're getting fired, but I'm going to recommend you to the new staff. And I, he said, because I, I like you, and uh, I think you're a good player. And uh, so we were calling Coach Jackson and those guys every day. Coach can tell you better than me. And uh, Coach would always keep me. Uh, always keep me informed, you know, to keep me encouraged. And uh, he said, uh, well, Nichols is going to uh, look at your tape. I'm sorry about that, guys. So uh, he said, Nichols is going to look at your tape. And then um, he called me and said, well, that recruiter really likes you, but they fired the staff, so we don't know what's going to happen. So they sent the tapes in here, 
And then Coach Jackson, this is what I heard through Coach Crochet. Coach Jackson said, uh, I think it was Coach Denzel Cox showed him the tape, because Denzel had the area at the time, Coach Cox. And uh, he was getting that area from the guy who originally recruited me. And uh, so Coach Jackson watched the tape for like 10 minutes, and he said, turn it off. Go sign the guy. And uh, so they signed me, and I had the one offer. So I uh, came here and uh, had some fun. Uh, I came in with Oscar. Oscar was a really good back. So we had two, arguably two of the better backs maybe to ever play in, in Louisiana at the same time, at the same time. I would put Big O and myself against anybody. Uh, I'm not going to sit up here and make excuses, but when I got to the NFL, I ripped out my hamstring my rookie year, and they just put me on IR. And I mean, really ripped. One was bigger than the other. I never recovered, but um, it was never a matter of ability. You know, I think it hurt me a little bit because I was from a small school in a small environment, and I, I went there and I was sort of a John Riggins is right here, George Rogers is right here, Kelvin Bryant, all those guys, Joe Theismann, and I'm kind of like looking at these guys like, wow, and I shouldn't have did that if I had to look back. This is my second year when the hamstring was better, but it wasn't 100%. If I had to do it over, uh, I'd have that big time edge. Uh, I'm, I got edge by myself as a scout. That's why I know I'm one of the best scouts in the NFL. And I know I know my stuff. You wouldn't keep me around, you know, that long from a small place dealing with these sharks. Um, and we get in the room. And, I beat him down one by one, including Belichick, and that's why he likes me. And you know, to tell him, you know, and um, this is natural for me. I, I can scout with my, I can, I can do that. I, I don't work at this. I hate to say it. I don't work at this. I, this is something I can. A lot of guys work their ass off at scouting. I don't work at it. I just, I was gifted. I was blessed to do this. And I started doing that back in high school, Coach. I tell you, I'd read all the magazines and know about all the guys. I didn't talk much, Brian. I was quiet because I was always, I was told, don't talk unless you have something to say <laughs> and know what you're saying. So I didn't know everything. I was trying to learn. I was always trying to absorb and, and, and gain stuff. So that helped me. For the first five years in the NFL, I didn't talk. I just took notes, asked questions. But after about year six or seven, I had all this knowledge I'd stolen from everybody else, plus my own stuff. I was ready. And now, my guys, when we talk, I kind of tickle because I meet guys from all over the country and they're from big programs, and we talk ball, mainly football, scouting, and they'll back down so fast. Sometimes I've got to tone it down not to scare them a little bit. So. Everybody, what I'm trying to say here is everybody's got their niche in life, and it didn't work out for me in terms of a long career in the NFL, but two weeks after I got fired, not fired, two weeks after I got cut from Saskatchewan after two years in Canada, I got a call uh, from the NFL to scout. So I went right from the playing field right into scouting, and boom, hit the ground running. Um, unfortunate, uh, 20... Seven years later, and I have, I've had a chance to work under the best people and grow uh, and learn it the right way. Um, and it's been a great ride. If you'd have told me, uh, Coach Rod, if, you, if you'd have told me when I was here at Nickel State, are you going to be a player personnel director for the Atlanta Falcons for a few years and you're going to go to Dallas and work for Jerry and Steven? I'd have laughed at you. I'd have said, you kidding me? I mean, couldn't fathom that, but it felt that way. To finish that story on my mom, when she said, uh, you're going to treat people right, one morning the phone rang, and it was a young lady. I was 10th, 10th 11th grade, and I was in the room sleeping, and she came out, knocked at the door, said, hey, Barbara's on the phone. I said, I don't want to talk to her. She says, she got really, she says, you want to treat people nice. Get out of that bed. 
so I got out of the bed and I grabbed the phone. I spoke, spoke to Barbara for about 10 minutes and I said, okay, cool. And when I got up, she said, you never know what you're going to have to do in life. You never know what you're going to need. Don't ever do that to people. You keep telling me you don't want to talk to that girl. And so I carried that into life in how I deal with people. And uh, I'm trying to sort of echoing what Brian said. Uh, the guy, Will McClay, who works for the Cowboys, I met him at a combine twice over 27 years and spoke to him briefly. Now, I was in a higher position than him. I was a player personnel director, and he was like, you know, a young, well, not a young scout, but he was a scout. So he looked at me from afar. He's African American, so he looked at me from afar like, man, I could do like this Lionel guy, you know? Read my bio and said I can pattern myself to learn from him and see how he does it. But I was good with Will when I saw him. I didn't know he was gonna be Jerry and Steven's right-hand man. I was just being who I was. So uh, when Atlanta and I parted ways mutually, didn't fire him, but mutually because we, we had a couple bad years and then Arthur like Blank likes to change things around. They were gonna move me to another area. And I said, listen guys, I, I'm not gonna take it like that. Just fire me. I had two years left on my contract. I was gonna you know, just travel for a year. I said, I'm not gonna go down like that and uh, take the hit for our, our lack of success. I said, fire me, I'm good. And the general manager was one of my best friends. He said, are you sure you want to do that? Arthur just wants me to move things around. I said, no, send me home. I'm good. Take a year off, because I had two years left. And so we get home, me and my wife, uh, and we go out to dinner. Uh, after I get fired that night, I come back, I see the light, because it flashes on the line, Atlanta, and they call me Vitale. That's another story. Uh, Atlanta and Vitale, um, part ways. So I get back home, uh, we see the light, I'm like, who's this? Maybe somebody called us, hang in there, man. And I get the call from Will, and uh, he said, hey, I'd like to have you come here. Jerry and Steven wants to meet you. He says, they, I told them all about you, they know about you, they did their homework. He says, I'm excited, man, would you do this? And I hung up to him, I'm like, how the hell do I know these people? I don't even, I met this guy twice, talked to him about 10 minutes apiece. And I said, why is he doing this? I said, okay. So I took the job, I'm gonna fast forward. So I'm in the office one night, and I'm spooked out. It's him in the next office, me in this office. We're doing some work late at night, watching some tape for the draft. Uh, that was a Zeke Elliott draft and, uh, and Dak. And so we're watching some tape, and I'm talking. To, so Nina calls me, and we're talking. I said, Nina, why did this guy hire me? I don't even know this crap. I said, I'm spooked out. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know these people in this building. I got she says, if you feel that way, get off this phone, go close the door and ask him why he hired you. And that's the night I went back in, closed the door and said, man, what am I doing here? Why did you hire me? I don't even know you. It's just weird. And he, and he broke down and he says, hey, you, when I, I found out who you were years ago. He says, a lot of guys now want to be my friend from around this league. He says, I wouldn't take their calls. He says, I know you are who you are, because when I was nobody in this business, you treated me like somebody. And he says, I never, ever uh, forgot that. And that goes back to, you're gonna treat people right. So the, the moral of my story is, if you treat people right, just con consistently throughout the time, when you have a bad, when you have something bad happen to you, somebody in that group of right people that you treated right, so I'm going to circle back and say, she needs that help. I'm going to call her up. I'm going to hook her up. Or some guy's going to call and say, hey, man, I got you back. And that's what happened. So I kind of fell a little bit, but I fell into a really good situation. Um, um, I want to talk about Brian briefly. This guy, you know, we got this thing in Scott, and we call, we call it toughness. He was, first of all, he was a punt return man. And, I tried it, Oscar tried, we couldn't do it. We couldn't catch the ball. Because the ball would circle and we would be there, boy, we, you know. And he would, he's right, he'd be like looking down and looking up and he'd catch the ball and I'm like, man, okay. And then he was so smooth, 
he was smooth, and he's got the thing that they call today swag. You hear people, oh, he's got swag. Dude got swag. <laughs> All those guys you see, Welsh Walk, Walker, and we got a guy named Switzer, Beasley, they're just like him. They're the same size. He's a, he was too early. He was way before, if he was coming out today, he would be a fifth or sixth round draft pick. That style. Look at what's playing in the league. That style right there. Okay, but the most important thing that I loved about him, he had that damn swag, and he was cocky. You gotta be cocky to, do, to be good in life and what you do. You gotta believe in yourself, okay? When I say cocky, you don't wanna rub people wrong all the time, but when they get in your way, you gotta let them know that, hey man, okay? I learned that from guys like you, and I read some books by Michael Jordan, who's good at what he does, and you gotta be willing to accept being good. So by being good, you're gonna make other people look bad sometimes. You're gonna call the people out. You are gonna look strong in front of people. And until you accept that, you cannot be the man. You cannot be the top. You cannot be at the top. I was humble and too humble and too respectful when I went into the NFL as a player. I wasn't gonna let that happen as a scout. I don't care who I'm talking to, Jerry, Steve, anybody. When we're talking about something that I know, they're getting it. And, and I'm, if they say, well, my opinion is this, I say, well, I respectfully respect your opinion, but this is why I feel this way, and, and I can show it to you right here. So I just want to get back to you, Brian, and let you know that when we were both young guys, the difference between you and a lot of other young guys is you're cocky as hell and you can just, you, you are a big man, little big man. Your heart and your mind was better than most, okay? I just want, when you were talking about different people that you played with, Keith Leonard over there, talk about another guy with heart. I sat on the phone with him for about an hour, just letting him know that about two months ago. Uh, Keith was a backup to Gordon Falco, and he didn't like it. He was pissed off. Uh, what, I'm, what, do you, what I'm trying to, uh, the moral of the story is, don't accept being number two or number, don't, it's not okay if you know you're better. Don't be willing to make people uncomfortable to let them know that I'm that man, give me that shot. That guy's like that. And everything he does, that guy over there, both of them are like, they get, they're edgy, they have edge. You gotta have edge in life to be successful. If I don't know anybody in life who's successful with no edge, I don't know anybody. If if he's successful, he inherited that, and somebody else had edge before him or her. You gotta have an attitude. You gotta have not. not it's a difference between having an attitude and treating people badly. But you gotta have edge. You gotta be confident and don't be afraid to put people in their place. And when I accepted that, then I grew, I evolved as a, as a, as a football man and as a person. Because your past hurt you at times. I came up humble, you know, no dad in the house, no father figure. Um, I'm gonna, and I'm going to cut this off, but I want to say one more thing. Zeb, raise your hand up, brother. He was a rookie coach my last year in high school, and he became like a brother a big brother to me. He would drop me home after practice. And I had no money, I'm so broke, mom. You know, come on, nobody had money in that house. I had sisters, mom, kids all over the place. He would drop me home and, uh, but he'd always make sure I had everything I needed, whether it's 10 bucks, you know, a high school kid. I come to college, 20 bucks, whatever, 40 bucks. That dude right there, that guy right there was always there for me. Coach would be there for me if I needed him. But I didn't need him because Zeb was supplying the cash. Okay? So you say, well, why did I drive here from Lafayette? Because you're my man, brother. Both of you guys are, but... And he's never... Both of them, they've never asked me for a penny. I got trouble when we go eat out. Or, you know, I got to hurry up and pull out my card or money because they're looking to pull money. And I feel bad when they even think about doing that. But those two guys over there... My family's not here today. I was inducted into a similar thing, like a high school thing, two weeks ago in Lowerville. 
or how ironic, people must think I'm old and dying. But, <laughs> and so my whole family was at the Laurelville one. I kind of talked them out of this one because I didn't want to make a big deal. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of emotional when I'm in front of groups and my family's around. I talked my daughter out of it and I talked my sister out of coming here today. I didn't talk to mom, but I said, well, it's going to be quick and I'll show you guys the flag, blah, blah, blah. But I, they wanted to all come. We would have had like 20 people in that audience. But they're going to get this because I'm going to try somehow to get, the, get a copy and they'll have it on Facebook. You know, I know how my, my daughters are. Uh, they'll be all over the place. They'll probably end up back where I work. But uh, I want to wrap this up and say that uh, uh, this is, this, I couldn't have made it here if it wouldn't have happened this way. I don't regret any move or anything that's, that's happened. Uh, I'm glad I'm back into the Nickel State family. I have not come here often over the last, I think, 15 years. Um, I will make it a regular uh, thing to come here on a yearly basis. I do make my own schedule so I can at least go to my alma mater and check out the kids. There is a defensive back here who's going to get drafted in about the fifth or sixth round. Don't tell him that, guys. So I'm going to watch him the night of the game while I'm checking out, getting the shaking hands and waving. Um, but it all started at Nichols. I know I'm rambling, but I don't care even. You know, I just want you guys to know that this is a once-in-a-lifetime thing, but I'm going to be uh, close to Nichols State from here on. I'm not. I'm, I'm going to make it a yearly thing where I'm showing up to a game at least once every year. And I'm coming to see my colonels, and I, I could talk like Brian. You said I can talk forever, but we got to get to this game. Happy. I'm honored. Uh, I take nothing for granted, guys. Nothing. Just because of where I come from. So, nothing. Yeah. All right.